Go. My, my, my good friend Danilo of <laughs> thank you, thank Pacto you, Helmets has asked me to give him some background on the history of the helmets in the golden era of motorsport, which is particular interest to him. And largely a part that our family company and my father in particular played. Uh, we've really got to go back to a tragedy which has done so much for the development of protective headwear. And I think if we start with uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, and Hugh Cairns, a neurosurgeon at Oxford, who when Lawrence crashed his bruff superior motorbike in the 30s and received terrible head injuries, Sir Hugh Cairns tried desperately to save his life, which regretfully he couldn't do, and was deeply moved by this, and really set him on a lifelong path of looking at protective headwear and the improvement of headwear. He wrote a, a paper for the, uh, for the Lancet, which is the famous medical paper, in 1941 regarding motorcycle dispatch riders' head injuries. And this was the first uh, really technical paper on head injury and what helmets did. And there was no doubt that a well-moulded uh, helmet with a hard shell with concussion tapes reduced head injury. And the original helmets of that period, you had a hard outer shell, you had a leather strap, and you had concussion tapes. Now within that paper, he said, I believe that between the concussion tape and the shell of the helmet, it might help if some padding were introduced. And that was the first real uh, record of introducing shock absorbing padding um, within the modern helmets or helmets of that period. Um, the next tragedy really, and going fast forward, it was uh, a motor racing driver in California called Pete Snell, who in the 50s uh, rolled his TR and received fatal head injuries when his helmet got half pulled off his head. And the medical doctor at that meeting was his great friend, Dr. George Snively. And Pete died from head injuries because his helmet was, was not of a particularly good design. And George then founded the Snell Memorial Foundation um, in Pete's memory and to promote the development of helmets. Um, if we then go forward to the 1950s, the late 40s and 1950s, when Grand Prix driving emerged again, and a lot of the drivers wore some form of headwear, but also a lot wore just a leather skull cap. And it was Dean Delamont of the RAC, who in the early 50s uh, said, uh, that the RAC required that anyone driving in a Grand Prix must wear a helmet. And this became adopted um, by the governing body of the sport at that time, which I presume was uh, based on the FIA or whatever uh, that evolved into the FIA. That was, sorry, Bill, that was in late 40s. Uh, I think it was the very early 50s. Very early 50s. Okay. And my father had also been working with um, Wing Commander Bennett at the RAE, a Royal Aircraft Establishment, Farnborough, mm. which was also um, promoting the development of protective headwear, of course, as we were then getting supersonic jets coming in. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the Americans started wearing what was called a jet helmet or a full coverage helmet in the Korean War, which mm. was the other sort of helmet evolution at the time. But we'll go back to the 50s, and the helmets then were largely, the racing driver's helmets, had evolved from the original polo helmet. Of course, all uh, modern headwear had evolved from riding caps and the polo cap. And the actual polo shape, which the moulds were used, obviously it was easier in terms of investment, 
was a particularly attractive shape. This, of course, has got a polo beak to protect the the wearer from the polo stick, or, which would come down on the helmet or could do. But it was that lovely shape, the curved rear back, and that sweep to the peak, that the the actual shape of the early helmets revolved. Yeah. Now these were made initially in in a felt and goss, which was a shellac moulded onto or hand laid onto a felt hood. And these early helmets um, were all made of of actually goss, a goss shell with a leather strap and the neck curtains. They they did absorb quite a lot of energy. They had concussion tapes, but they had a leather strap, a fixed peak. They were very light and extremely comfortable to wear. Um, then obviously the next step forward was in terms of modern plastics. The shell became fiberglass and then cork shock absorbing padding was added. And then the chin straps went from leather, which obviously were easier to tear, and uh, the, to a proper quick release or a proper steel buckle with a terrolene strap and cork shock absorbing padding. And then following the work at RE Farnborough, the, in particular on the Everoak helmets, were added temple protection. There was a modification and extension down and the first helmet with temple protection worn in a Grand Prix was by Mike Hawthorne in 1957. And my father knew him personally, and Mike had one of the original Everoak helmets with that temple protection. And it was the helmet he wore when he was the first world champion, the first British world champion in 1958. And the, ne the next step was the jet helmet, which was the Everoak Racemaster. So the there was a straight evolution of the helmets. The uh, Sir Hugh Cairns was really responsible for the first British standard that was introduced in 1950-51, which was BS 2001. And that was the forerunner of all helmet standards in the world. Um, then, George Snively, I've already mentioned, had formed the Snell Foundation in the early 60s. I personally met George in the 60s uh, when he came over to buy a WSM Sprite mm. and I was racing an MG Midget or a Sprite at the same period. I met George at Albury Laboratories where it was a test house for Snell and George really mentored me um, through uh, Everoak uh, obtaining these these Snell approval for our helmets, which, which we acquired in the very late 60s. Um, and George was a personal friend. I went to America. I worked with him in California briefly, carrying out testing, and also at the time, of course, visited the Bell Helmet Factory. <laughs> yeah, that was in, 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 in 1969, 19s. No, a little later in the 70s. And, 70s. and I went to the okay. Bell, Bell Factory. And um, your father also visited this company in in the fifties? No. No, 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 no. no. He uh, Bell Helmets didn't get going until till the um, early sixties. Okay. And then okay. they they acquired um, Top Tech in America. Okay. Who got the first world patent for the use of polystyrene, which was okay. the, polystyrene. the okay. quantum leap in in ed protection. But the Race Master models. And the early Everoaks were all cork lined. Okay. Um, but we uh, we pioneered the fiberglass Grand Prix helmet. My father was moulding fiberglass helmets as early as the 1950. Okay. And uh, 51, although a lot of the helmets were in felt and goss, we were doing glass fibre, then temple protection, then the full jet race master that Jack Brabham won in the World Championship in 59. And of course, Graham Hill, Jim Clark, yeah. they all wore those helmets in period. The, fir the first racing helmets comes with cork inside or without cork? Without cork. Oh, without cork. So the Goss was without cork. The very early glass ones, I think, 
possibly were without court, but uh, but that would have been altered pretty early on. I think most of them had court. Oh, okay, very interesting. Court chop absorbing padding. Okay, uh, so you're continually putting uh, cork padding until 70s. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, polystyrene, uh, th there was a world patent, so we couldn't, at that time, patents are more generally honoured than they are now, or they were harder to get round, but uh, Sneller, the quad top tech, had got the world patent, and um, that, that and, and still the majority of modern protective Grand Prix helmets, yeah, so the yeah. liners now are 40, 45 mil thick, um, they're... They're of different densities. They 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 have cone head interlocking liners, um, but they're they're still using polystyrene or forms of it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's still to be to be beaten in terms of the material to use. Yeah, this is a, it's a very interesting to know the story about, and even more interesting that is stories from you, because you lived in the, in that time and and you met the guys and you met the people who work with you and. And you saw the evolution of the helmet well, in that we, time. We made the helmets for Herbert Johnson. I knew Max Glazier, the managing director, well, and Tim and John, who worked in the shop in Bond Street. I used to process all their orders, or I was even making that, moulding the hats at the time. Uh, so I knew them well. I, I knew Les Leston, who's a, a great friend of my father, and yeah. Les had his shop in High Holborn, and he was really the first wholesaler of automotive racing accessories so yeah. we used to laugh at his go faster stripes and that but he had a very successful business um and we made for d lewis of great portland street you know lewis leathers who are still going uh imperium we made for them the tt helmets uh, the grand prix helmets we made uh, griffin helmets for terry yeah. ogilvy hardy yeah at one time i knew terry quite well with his Project X, and he knew all the uh, Formula 3 drivers or future Grand Prix drivers at the time. I made King helmets for Barry Sheen. I knew Barry wow. in the period. Um, all these great characters. I met Mike Halewood. Uh, he usually wore a helmet's helmet, Mike. Uh, I knew Billy Ivy really well, his great friend. Billy always wore uh, helmets. Um, and tragically, most of these boys now are dead and gone. You know, they were very dangerous days. Yes. The so-called golden era. And then we had Jackie Stewart to thank for really bringing in safety. Yes. Uh, circuit safety in particular. And uh, modern equipment, seat belts and, and more besides, which were, uh, you know, much needed. Okay. It's much safer day now, again now. Very interesting stories about the racing... Uh, time and we are really thankful Bill to receive for second time in your home yeah and uh, we enjoy very much to be with you and and tell well, your stories the, the story went on well I, I knew um, Derek Ongaro who then took over really on the safety side at the RAC I worked with Derek in promoting the date stamping and um, mm. in in helmets which now, now carry a RAF, RAC sticker which uh, I did the original work um, with Derek and, uh, you know, he he had his history, sadly, and another guy no longer with us, but he, he had a good history with the RAC and they've done so much over the years to promote helmet safety and yeah. uh, driver safety and, and still doing so. You know, I, I was privileged to be part of a family that were helmet makers for, you know, literally hundreds of years and grew up a, in, in a helmet making family with a father who, whose life was dedicated to saving lives. Yeah, and, yeah. and right up until quite recently, um, in 2012, I've been involved in, in uh, manufacturing safety headwear and, and still working right up until then with, with the Snell Foundation. Oh, amazing, yeah. amazing, yeah. Uh, and who I greatly admire. But no, it, and uh, lots of people are carrying it forward now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like yourself from the historical viewpoint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm trying to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah, it was no, a real no, pleasure. No, I can bore, bore you to tears. Yeah, tea, I know tea you know everything. Story. No, I don't. I wish I did. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, been, been um, you know, over the years, a fascinating time. And uh, there, there's still, you know, this period of motor racing history is, 
is uh, much admired, you know, and we've still got Sir Sterling, uh, that great icon of British motor racing yes, is, absolutely. Is, is, is still with us, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your interview and for your time. My oh, pleasure. Again, yeah. and hope to see you again no, soon. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't intend going anywhere at the moment. Yeah. No, you, 